Hello, Breakfast Club. Sister Danger here. I've traded places with Nathan Brendan Masters for this Wednesday, and I'm going to talk about the burden of proof today. Evening, everyone. If I look really tired, it's because I am. Yesterday was my birthday, and I perhaps had some very cheap wine, cheap cheese, and cheap crackers all together to celebrate my birthday. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I was a little bit hungover this morning, but that is no longer the case. I'm just tired. So before I get into today's topic, I want to just draw your attention to a couple of things and then we'll move on. So the first is the Kilroy free speech event and it's taking place in Phoenix, Arizona on April 21st and 22nd. And I would like to encourage everybody to go to KilroyEvent.com, check out the lineup. And, you know, if you're interested, everybody is invited. So if you're interested, please, by all means, um, pre-purchase a ticket or otherwise kick in a few bucks to help support the event. And also um, that we have a link to leave comments and suggestions if you're interested in presenting or being on a panel then I will leave all the relevant links for this in the low bar where you can go and do that. Follow on Facebook and Twitter. So I will be there and hopefully I'll be there with my new trailer. I'm really excited about that. And if you want to help with my birthday wish this year, I would love you forever. And I'll put a link to where you can go do that as well. You can actually see what my plans for next year are. The second thing that I want to draw your attention to quickly is that once again, the FCC is really mucking around with net neutrality and there's, they're voting on it here in the beginning of December to basically repeal the safeguards for net neutrality that went into place in 2015. So I will put a link in the low bar for how you can contact your congressperson for that. Please do so if you value the internet at all and that it is free and open to everybody. And so with those two things out of the way, then let us talk about the burden of proof today. I wanted to discuss this topic because all the sex scandals that are, have been happening over the past couple of weeks really seem to have sparked a new wave of people saying things like, why don't we just believe the victims? Why is it always on the victim to prove the guilt of their abuser, you know, or assailant? I see this question frequently and sincerely enough to lead me to the conclusion that the people who are asking don't genuinely know the answer, which is fine. I see people often trying to answer this question by saying things like, the burden of proof is on the accuser because that's how our legal system works, or because people are innocent until proven guilty. And while they have good intentions for saying that and trying to use that as an explanation, I guess to me that doesn't actually address what I hear as the fundamental question being asked. Obviously, people know that that is how our legal system is. So I think that what they're really trying to ask is, why is our legal system that way? And it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine that so many people always seem to be under the impression that the laws in our society just spring up out of the whimsy of a bunch of old dudes sitting around a table making some rules that do nothing but benefit only themselves because they can. Our laws are built on fundamental philosophies and ideas. Those things happen first and then these get translated into our legal system and then they there is a sort of symbiotic relationship between the evolution of ideas and morals and ethics and then a slow changing in the legal system that reflects that. So I wanted to talk about that today and I did have the occasion 
to discuss this topic with some legal expert friends of mine in order to make sure that I just wasn't way off the rails and left field telling you guys a bunch of BS. So the burden of proof is a reference to the fact that the person who is accusing somebody of a crime, the plaintiff, is responsible for presenting evidence that demonstrates the factualness of their claim. The idea goes all the way back to ancient Rome where it's tied in with the presumption of innocence and it was turned on its head during the Dark Ages which lasted several centuries and it was during this time that it was upside down that we got things like the Inquisition and the Salem Witch Trials and eventually it got righted and then evolved into what we understand as our legal system today. So why do we keep it this way and not switch it back? So there are two primary reasons for this. And reason number one is that you cannot prove a negative. It is not possible for a person to demonstrate with evidence that they didn't do something that never occurred. This is really similar to the philosophical argument of Bertrand's teapot. And I'm going to walk you through a really a simple thought experiment that demonstrates the flaw in placing the burden of proof on the accused. Let's say that that is the case. Let's say that it is incumbent on the, the accused person to show their innocence. And then let's also say that you have an evening home alone and you decide to stay in and read a book. Let us also say that I accuse you of kidnapping my cat on this very same evening. The police come, they detain you on suspicion of catnapping. See what I did there? <laughs> and uh, what do you have to say for yourself? Where were you at the time of the crime? Well, you were home, alone. Do you have anybody that can cooperate this for you? No. You decided to stay home alone and read a book. So you have no alibis. Well, how do we know then that you stayed at home all night and that you did not go catnapping Sister Danger's cat? And you say, well, I don't have the cat. Well, uh, how do we know that you didn't take the cat and uh, kill it and dump its body? You don't have a car. How would you get there? Well, we don't know how you got there. Maybe, maybe you walked there. Maybe you hitched a ride there with a stranger. Or maybe you found some other means of getting there. And you say, well, I didn't. And we say, well, how do we know that you're telling the truth on that? You say, Sister Danger doesn't even have a cat. Well, she says that she had a cat. She found it. It was a stray. You haven't even talked to her for a year. How could you possibly know that she even had a cat to be catnapped? Who knows? Maybe you were stalking her. Maybe you happened to go by her house and see the cat. Maybe you didn't know that she had a cat until you arrived at her house with a different crime originally in mind, and then you saw the cat and decided, I'm going to catnap the cat right then and there on the spot. So this sort of fabrication can go on indefinitely. And the only thing that you have in your defense against it is that you say you didn't do it. And so it's your word versus Sister Danger's word then that means that you're going to be found guilty based on nothing more than the fact that I accused you of doing that thing. Essentially what this means is that an accusation and a guilty verdict are synonymous with one another. One person has to do nothing more than accuse somebody else of something and because there's no way for them to prove that they didn't do a thing that didn't happen, they're automatically guilty. I have also seen some people who understand why the burden of proof is on the accuser, and, or at least they seem to, and they still say that they are fine or okay with a few innocent people having to suffer so that we can get the bad guy. This notion is 100% antithetical to not just our legal system, but the British legal system. And for those of you who are biblical people out there, this principle is 
actually um, demonstrated in the sto story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God says that, you know, if but for a few innocent people in those cities, he will spare the entire city, including the wicked people. This idea is most well known as Blackthorn's formula, which essentially states that it's better that 10 guilty men go free than one innocent person be convicted. And I'm paraphrasing there, but you can go ahead and Google it. And I'm going to come back to elaborate on Blackthorn's formula um, here in a little bit. But there are a few problems with condemning innocent people in order to get at guilty ones. So the first is that it is knowingly and willfully dishonest. And I guess if you don't know why dishonesty is wrong, then this whole video is probably going to be beyond you anyway. So I don't really think I need to elaborate on that. Um, to wrongfully punish somebody, though, is essentially to sacrifice their freedom and life without their consent, and that is tantamount to murder. It infringes on their basic human rights, which is one of the founding libertarian principles of this country, which is the right to life. <laughs> if you think that it would be wrong to walk through a shopping mall and gun down innocent people in a crowd so that you can get to one guy on the other side of that crowd who is an actual murderer, then you understand the basic idea of why it isn't okay to throw innocent people under the bus so that you can get that one bad guy. Most people, when asked, are you willing to sacrifice your life, either by going to prison for life or going to the electric chair and the death sentence, are you willing to sacrifice your life so that that guilty guy over there can also go to jail? Most people will answer no. Uh, there are some people, actually, who might say yes to that question in order to protect an actual criminal. This is also a problem because if somebody who is innocent of a crime steps forward and says that they did it because they want to protect the person that actually did it, then that means the actual criminal is still at large and it's costing everybody time, money, and resources to put the wrong person in jail anyway. Infringing on somebody's right to life in order to get at a guilty person is probably the number one reason that it isn't okay to condemn innocent people, followed closely by Blackstone's formula, which again is that it's better to let 10 guilty men go free than it is to condemn one innocent person. And the reason for this, to elaborate on this a little bit, is because it undermines the social fabric of society. It undermines the legal security um, in a society. If a person can be punished, regardless of whether or not they broke the law, then there's no security in being a law-abiding citizen. There is no particular reason that anybody would have to obey the law versus break the law because they can be equally punished whether or not they are following the rules that we have set down as a society. Short of their own satisfaction or knowledge that they are a good, right, and moral person, um, there is nothing to be gained by being that virtuous person. Further, if you were an innocent person who then became accused of something, then you wouldn't have any reason whatsoever to come forward and try to make your case because you're going to be convicted regardless of your innocence. So all it takes is an accusation against somebody of some sort of crime or perpetration. And at that point, there is 
no reason for you to not go and live um, a criminal lifestyle if that's what it takes for you to survive. The accusation and the guilty verdict are one and the same. So to wrap this up, those are essentially the two biggest reasons as to why the burden of proof is on the accuser. I hope that you guys found this interesting and helpful if you didn't know these things before. I, of course, always appreciate comments down below. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow and stuff your faces with all the things. I myself am going to my brother's house to have Thanksgiving with my brother and my dad and then I'm coming, coming back, getting the final bank paperwork finished up and then on Saturday I get to go collect my new trailer. So <laughs> I'm really excited about that uh, because it essentially is one of the big things that I was working on this year so that next year I can go travel vlogging in in style. <laughs> uh, comfortably without sleeping in my car at rest stops. Anyway, have a great night everybody. Happy Thanksgiving and I will see you all on the flip side.